Hi, everyone. Welcome to Meet the Artist with Kamari Carter. Before we begin, I would like to do an accessibility check. And I guess I should also introduce myself. I'm Eileen Jang Lynch, Curator of Visual Arts at Wave Hill. And Kamari, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you for having me. So as far as the accessibility check, I wanted to let you all know that today we have a few options for participation. You can ask a question using the chat function or Q&A function. For those dialing in, if you wanna ask a question, you can text 732-470-4428. And I just wanna make sure that everyone sees the chat here. And if you raise your hand, we will call on you and we can unmute you to speak. We are not providing ASL interpretation, but are using closed captioning through Zoom. To start closed captions, as you can see here, please press the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. I'm going to put some shortcuts in the chat. And now I'm going to read a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded homelands of the Lenape, the Munse, the Manahattan, the Canarsi, the Matinecock, the Shinnecock, and other indigenous nations. We respect that many indigenous people continue to live and work on this land and recognize their ongoing contributions to the region. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans whose labor built and developed the Northeast during the colonial era and beyond. So before diving into a conversation with Kamari, we will be playing a game of Hangman. Can everyone see the chalkboard? So if you would like to start guessing letters, um, I, we can begin the game. And to let everyone know, the winner will get a prize. If you think you know the answer or the phrase, please use the raise hand tool and we will call on you so you can say the phrase out loud. And for the winner, if you could stay on after the talk, um, that would be great. And we can organize the prize with you. So let's start. You can use the chat, you can type in your letter any letter you want to start with? Oh, oh, we. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have an E. I will try my best to keep track of the letters that are coming in. So we have an E. Okay. Oh, they're coming in fast. <laughs> okay. One this, second. Okay, so we've got we've got three A's. <laughs> Okay, so we got the E there. We have a Z. So, so there's no Z. All right. Excuse my cursor, <laughs> my mouse drawing there. Okay. So we have three A's. A is a hot button letter right now. So okay. it has to be at least one. <laughs> okay. Now we've got two T's. Ooh. We got a we got a double guess going on. Okay. An now I. I see an I. Here, yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got an O. Yeah, you all are doing well. Let's see. We've got an N. I see an N and a D, but we can only take one letter. So we'll go with the N. Sure. Um, okay. Yes. We have an okay. N already. Now we have a W. Ooh. 
think we are missing one of the ends. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. No, no, no. And now a D. Okay, and then I see an H. Oh, no. And an R. Oh, we, we already guessed O. We're, we're pretty close though. <laughs> With what we have, does anyone think, oh, a U, okay. Any other guesses? A B. We are close. The C. Mm. Nice. Three C's. Nice. Okay. An M. Oh, great. We have a raised hand. Hey, we have a raised hand. <laughs> Let's unmute. Oh, I'm seeing multiple raised hands. <laughs> Well, who was the first? Gian, was Gian the first? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. I Gian, would you like to guess? Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Congratulations for your show. Um, I'm going to just guess now that it's... Is it, is it, is it home in circumstance? No. Oh, okay. Uh -oh. okay. We've got another opportunity for a raised hand then. <laughs> we're all, Take we're it. Right. Yes. Anyone else? <laughs> Although I see. Yes, raise your hand if you think you know. Oh. Oh, I think. oh we have to. Was it Ellie? Uh, Ellie yes, was it's next. a pomp and circumstance. Correct. You, you are correct, and you are the winner. Thank nice. you. Um, so please awesome. stay on after the talk, and we will discuss your prize. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Congratulations. My pleasure. Cool. When we were troubleshooting that, we were trying to guesstimate how quickly people would guess it. I would say that was right within the time. <laughs> Definitely, yes. <laughs> almost, almost to the T. Wonderful I would job. Say wow. so. so I'm going to stop sharing and we can have a discussion before we dive into um, your installation, Kamari. Awesome. So Kamari and I wanted to talk about the game and how did it make everyone feel while they're playing it. Just like general thoughts, I guess, maybe relating to having played it in the past or perhaps if you didn't grow up in it or you grew up outside of the Americas and it wasn't played as often or there was something that was played similarly. Just curious about your general overall thoughts of playing the game and if it reminded you or sparked anything within you. Feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to text in the chat, whatever you prefer. Okay. Linda, Linda says fun, played it all the time. Cool. Salvador says it reminded me of the days when we had a substitute in middle school. Linda said enjoyed it with, child with children. Jean said that she played it in Korea growing up. Um, 
and can't believe how it got transferred uh, there. Um, Probably during Korean War time, mm -hmm. I felt protective of the figure appearing by wanting to not saying wrong letters, I guess. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you say that. I, I think that's a, a nice little segue into kind of a lot of the things that I was thinking about in regards to the installation and the game itself. Um, oh, and Gabriel's asking, why did I pick the phrase pomp and circumstance? Um, but yeah, that's, there you go. Even more of a perfect segue into what I was <laughs> sharing. Um, I found it very interesting that this game that we were teaching and playing um, to and as children uh, was kind of teaching that the wrong answer results in death. And I too felt as though, and it's a bit of a common theme in a lot of the work that's installed in the show, but I felt as though there was this kind of onus on my part as a child to protect the disembodied or nameless figure because I didn't want to make a mistake that would result in the harm of another at my own hand. Um, so I totally hear that. And that was kind of one of the main things that I was thinking about while making the work is just the, the idea of the work in its entirety um, from a very, very young age and thinking about the morbidity and all of the different layers of that morbidity. Um, but to speak more about why I chose Pomp and Circumstance, the work uh, and kind of the apotheosis of the show comes from this very interesting story about the Hudson Valley and these two young slaves by the name of Bet and Dina. Um, all of the events of the story took place in 1793 and 1794 respectively, but essentially there was a family feud between these two slave owners that owned separate properties, the Saunders and the Gavinsworths. And the story goes that the Saunders' daughter was being courted by the Gavinsworths' eldest son. And the Saunders were not very fond of that whatsoever. So <laughs> um, they had a slave by the name of Pomp and this slave, was coerced uh, into setting fire to the government source's property. The reward for doing this was going to be a gold watch because the Saunders was really good friends with a jeweler uh, in town at the time. And Pomp didn't feel as though he could do this alone. So he took the help and the aid of Bet and Dina, who were aged 12 and 14 at the time, respectively. In the middle of the night, the three of them, Pomp, Bet, and Dina, take live coals from the Saunders property, put them inside of a lantern, and then go to the Goblin Source property and lay them on a stack of hay. And as they are watching this hay engulf, quickly they realize that it's getting very, very out of hand. And by the morning, there is about 26 homes that have been destroyed and roughly 60% of downtown Albany at that time was destroyed, all set ablaze. Um, and it was this strange coercion and amalgamation of deceit and trickery because Pomp never really gave Bet and Dina any incentive whatsoever. And it was a interesting um, tale. And as I was reading up on it, I felt as though in the entirety, there was just a lot of pomp and circumstance around the situation. It was interesting that the individual that kind of started this whole situation, whose full name is Pompey, but Pomp, as he was named at the time, uh, happened to have that or share that name. But I felt as though it was just a very appropriate phrase to use um, in a way where I wanted 
the story to be the groundwork for the installation and in a sense be a teachable situation where we could also think past the installation and more about just histories, historiography and kind of life and death in that very fashion, but also for it to directly relate to the story itself. So that's why it shows um, that phrase and that very phrase and that very story informs most of the rest of the work. Thank you, Kamari, for sharing. Yeah, and thanks. it was intentional to leave, to have the figure there, but to leave some of the, the blanks. It was, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't, even when we were installing and you were the first person to actually guess it, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't want it to feel as though the entirety of the phrase was given. But at the same time, it was important that there was a figure that was present simply for the relation to and in conversation with the other works. Right. Um, so I kind of wanted to find a common or a nice middle ground of that. And I, I think that's how it resulted in the way that it did. Mm -hmm. And I think now we can share the screen and see some images. I mean, you can see the image behind me, but share additional images of the installation. Totally. So here is an installation view and you can see childhood here with some chalk pieces at the top. I'll just go to the next one so you can see the details. And Kamari, I just wanted to touch upon, I mean, we've, we've played this as children. I think mm. as we can see through the chat, like we, we all have. Mm. Um, I think it's it's even still played today. It is, um, yeah. There are, as I have seen, different renditions of the way that it's played today. There's like a version with fish and um, as you are getting the answers wrong, more fish are caught and end up leaving the water, which is strangely enough, a very cyclical nature of the actual origin of the game because one of the first renditions of it appearing in literature is from a children's game book um, called Birds, Beasts, and Fishes in 1894. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that very interesting that it made its way right back around. Um, and I think the other more popular way that it's played is um, there is a tree and the tree has apples. And when you get the answers wrong, some of the apples fall from the tree. And then once there are no more apples, the game is over. So there have been very active pushes to make it a less morbid game, but these things take time. And I think it's gonna be a while before we very heavily investigate why we played this and how we can prevent uh, it coming back in the same capacity in the future completely. Yes, I think so too. And it's because there's this, this violence here, but it's, it's silent, you know, mm -hmm. it's played on paper, it's played on this chalkboard. And, you know, in school, it's, it seemed like that was, that was okay. And it's right. not. Right, yeah, and we, we teach it inherently that it is okay. We gamify it to palette it, but I think that that's the exact critique that I wanted to kind of have a conversation around is that every decision and every choice that we make, we do need to think quite critically of. And when we are doing what we can to teach others and the next generation and things of the like, I do think that it's important to think critically about the ways in which we teach these kinds of lessons. I, I don't in any way think that the game inherently holds this morbid and violent tendency. I do think that it's an important game to play regarding spelling and knowing words and etymology and things of the like. I just, when I thought about playing it and knew that I wasn't really at a point when I was very young to think critically about why are we letting this man dangle? And even though that man, because the chalk was often white, doesn't look anything like me, I have seen in books of people that do look a little bit like me doing that same thing. And that might not make me feel too great. 
I think that that's something that we should have a conversation about. And I think that the more that we have this kind of conversation, the more that we can see this kind of evolve and change as it has. Right, that this type of systemic racism, you know, is, is in, these, in these games. Definitely. Um, can I ask at what, do you recall at what point you had that feeling? I think probably, I want to say fourth or fifth grade. I think fourth or fifth grade was when I started to make connections on the difference that I was with my peers. I think that's like, I, I, I think actually that's kind of close to like the Freudian way that you understand like the id and like the super ego and things of the like. I want to say roughly like six to eight ish is mm -hmm. when I started to realize like, oh, okay, I'm different than other people and that's perfectly okay. And I have learned to embrace and accept that. But some of these things that other people may not relate to in a violent manner, I understand almost immediately, but I don't really know how to articulate that. Um, so yeah, I would say maybe like late fourth grade, early fifth grade. So I was like, oh, this is, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> I had a question about how, how this insulation um, has personally affected you or like working on this insulation? Oh, um, sure. Well, and yeah, it was, I feel like I learned a lot about the practicality of the heinous history that we read so much about in making the work. I was making the work that is entitled Rekindled, which is the gallows that you see there in the photo to the left with a friend of mine who happens to be an architect. Um, he actually was insurmountable in making the space look the way that it did because he did a wonderful job giving me some renderings before we were able, uh, actually able to get everything into the room. So I am eternally grateful for that. But I remember when we were cutting wood and doing a little bit of painting and hammering and nailing and things of the like, it was something that I saw become almost a family pastime. I could see the practical implication of building a gallows for its intended use, but I could also see how it was not something that you could do alone. So in this anathema for other kinds of people, simply based on them being a different color and having more melanin, you had to corral other people to also agree and say, hey, we're gonna do this thing. Because while we were making it, as soon as you get the vertical beam up, it's really heavy and it's not something you can support by yourself. But outside of that, everything else is very practical. Having a support beam is very practical. Making it at a certain height is very practical. So it was a really interesting process where I saw like, this is almost like a family bonding situation but rooted in hatred. And I could, I could see all of that process in the process of making. It was very interesting to be on the other end of something that you only like read about and see about in a very heinous way and to create it sculpturally and be like, oh yeah, this makes sense. And if I thought differently, and if I grew up in 1920, I would maybe understand. Um, I, I would, I would get why that seemed to be appropriate. It's really damaging and really painful to know that that's probably how people thought, but it was, there was a one-to-one -one relationship that I, that I understood in the process of making. And that, that came along with a lot of the works in, in the installation actually. Sure, I mean, this corralling, this group of people that you're talking about I mean, in downtown Albany, they had a designated place right. for lynching. Yeah, Kingster Hill and um, Elm and Main Street, where the hangman's elm tree stood and still stands, actually. Um, 
yeah, it's still in Albany, New York, if you are there. <laughs> I paid a site visit, very interesting. Um, but that's, that's also just a, a whole different convoluted conversation about, you know, uh, monuments and how long they should stand, whether or not they are still standing and things of the like. Can you talk to us about, so the rekindle, the sculpture and the lantern, can, mm -hmm. you, can you tell us more about it and how, what the lantern symbolizes? Definitely. Um, I, I think in a lot of my work and a lot of my practice, I do my best to not shy away from morbidity or things that may be dark or troublesome or gruesome or fearsome or uh, even just a little obscure, obfuscated. But at the same time, I want to ensure that I am not in my practice perpetuating any violence. And I also want to ensure that I am very um, read up and studied up on what it is that I'm talking about so that I don't perpetuate any violence unintentionally. So in the work, I wanted there to be the sculpture that is the gallows. And at its surface, it can almost be somewhat innocuous, I would argue. I think if you are in the space and there's nothing that's hanging from it, it's almost missable. You might not really notice what's going on. And that could be a number of things. It could be the, uh, the color of the space in the room. Um, it could be the size of it. But I felt like the thing that was the most violent and the thing that would have perpetuated the most harm would have been to keep the actual news present. So I wanted that removed completely. And then when I was thinking about the story itself, there was obviously the object of the lantern. And so I felt as though kind of with the iconography of like lanterns and a passage forward, um, a light in a dark place and things of the like. But additionally, because it was a actual piece of the story itself and it holds a candle, which is usually used as a commemoration tool, I thought it was kind of necessary to have that be the symbol that is present with the gallows to take away some of the violence that's inherent in the full sculpture with the noose itself and to add something that I think palettes the work in a way that can have or spark that conversation. And it's as if the lantern symbolizes well, commemorates, memorializes the bodies of Definitely. Dina and Bette and Palm and other um, victims of this Definitely. violence. Yeah. Absolutely. I also intentionally had it hang at the height that it does. Um, there's a lot of intentionality around a lot of the work, but, but yeah, I, in a lot of this show, as Sal and I will discuss a little bit later, because I was kind of, one of the things that we had noticed while we were installing is that a lot of my show kind of focuses on the lack of the body, um, but the implied body nonetheless. So that's definitely uh, one version of that. I think now we can move on to your video piece, Ligature Signature, and we can show a clip of it. Um, oh, Jesse uh, made a really good point, um, and I will share that when we get to the rope work. <laughs> okay. That's about the intentionality around the work, and I will absolutely share that when we get to the rope work. Sounds good. So we will be playing an excerpt of the video.
awesome. Those are my hands, by the way, in case you were wondering. <laughs> and in that video, Kamari, you are trying to spell your name with that manila rope. Is that correct? correct. That is correct. I Rope was a material that I had um, in preparation for the show, quite a bit of. Um, I was doing like some testing of the strength of the rope, its yield points, uh, weighing and things of the like. So I knew that I wanted to use rope in the work. And I had arrived on using it in a video work um, when I was reminded of a video artist that I really appreciate. She had a show at New Museum. Uh, her name is Sarah Megenheimer. And there's a 2012 work of hers uh, called Nothing Comes From Talking But Sound. And it's this work where there's a blue uh, painter tape square on a wall and she is throwing wet noodles, wet pasta noodles. And uh, underneath this, this uh, blue square, there is a letter and it's A through Z. And every time that there's a new letter, it's a new bit of wet noodles that are thrown. And it always forms whatever arbitrary or new or random uh, shape that it's going to. And then intermittently between the A through Z, she, she sometimes takes that very shape and then kind of changes exactly what's going to be on screen. It's a really minimal, but also I felt like very prolific work. And it's really short. It's like, I wanna say a minute, 62 seconds or so. Um, but it was incredibly engaging, even though there were very few elements in it. Mm -hmm. So the entire framework I really, really appreciate it. And so I started studying up on like different creative processes and different artists that have done things similar with like very few details, but try to tell a short form, long form story. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I arrived at Ligature Signature. I was thinking about the terms and because the work seemed somewhat close to me, I felt like it was important that I put myself in it. Mm -hmm. So while I'm tugging this rope, I'm also making the attempt to spell my name. And then I'm constantly interrupted by this disembodied force, again, the body and or lack thereof, uh, that is completely stopping that process because I have to start it over again. Um, and yeah, I felt like the terminology kind of fit each other um, and also was a pretty good homage to the rest of the show mm -hmm. and was in conversation with it. So I kind of felt as though they all connected in that way. Definitely. I mean, hearing that first sudden drop was very startling. Right, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was because so much of my previous work is in sound and oriented mm -hmm. around sound, that was the most important aspect of the video work. I tend to not usually think when it comes to moving image that sound comes first, but in mm -hmm. some instances I would argue that it does. And because so little elements were given on screen, everything that you see and hear is a, something that's readable. And so I wanted to make sure that the audio was read mm -hmm. almost in tandem as the visuals are being read. And if you don't know what's coming, I wanted to try my best to figure out how to keep somebody engaged in like seeing and hearing these constant impulse responses over and over again. Definitely, there seems to be like a panic even when exactly. the hands are yeah, spread in the- Panic of labor mm -hmm. and also there's an aspect of frustration but then also confusion as the ropes are being dropped until a certain point and then you just kind of get used to it and you continue on. Mm -hmm. And I also felt like that spoke to just the experience of people of color often where there are times where instances may happen and you are very confused by it but mm -hmm. also you are told and encouraged to roll with the punches and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and X, Y, and Z. And so I felt like that was evocative in the, in the video itself as well. Mm -hmm. And as you're pulling on the rope, are you trying to metaphorically undo this history? Definitely. Or... I, I mean, I think the history is much greater than myself <laughs> and much greater than the work itself. Mm -hmm. But I would say that that's definitely an aspect of it. I'm mostly concerned with the doing and undoing of 
my relationship and my association to the history. Anything that I had perpetuated or things that have perpetuated against and or at me, I wanted to feel as though the work was internalized and then this is the external version of that. But yeah, the history and its undoing and its tying um, is definitely a part of the narrative in the video for sure. And then you had mentioned as a sound artist, there are maybe minimal components visually. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's carried out into this installation that has very sculptural aspects, but it is also very minimal. Totally. To a certain yeah. Degree. yeah, I I think the work that I appreciate the most and maybe that I resonate with the most would have to be ones that allow you to bring your own critical read to it first before you read like a wall text or you read um, uh, the artist statement. Uh, work that gives you something to understand and something to sit with and digest. And then when you have the opportunity or if you choose to engage with it further, you can learn a lot more, both about the way that you initially thought about the work, but then how somebody else was thinking about the work to hopefully prime you to think about things differently. And so I wanted to encourage that in the space as well. I didn't wanna push my ideology on anyone, but if they had the opportunity to think or uh, choose to think more critically about the work, and if that's what they wanted to do and, and engage with it further, I wanted to make that opportunity. Sure, or that they could pick up the card text. Or oh, they could pick up the card <laughs> text at the front of the door. <laughs> but maybe they'll read it after they see everything in the show. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So in, in thinking about or talking about how all of your, the elements are tied together in your installation, let's move on to the Americana Ouroboros. Yeah. We can see it here. And then I'm going to advance to see some details or show some details. Totally. So, yeah, it's Ouroboros Americana is a very interesting work. Um, like I mentioned, I had an entire spool of rope that was left over from doing like some tests and a little bit of studying. And I knew very deeply that I wanted to use a lot of it. <laughs> and it was a little unclear exactly how that would manifest in the show. And then when I started doing some research on just lynching and lynching laws in America, I came to find out that the Emmett Till Anti Lynching Act was passed at the house level in February of 2020, which obviously is very great news. It was passed at Senate level in 2018. Um, but the first time that there was an attempt to get this passed and lobbied was in the year 1900. And so I obviously took those, those figures from that point to 2020, and that served as 120 years of inaction. So I decided to use 120 feet of rope. So that was the first bit. And I was like, okay, I think this works. And I know that this is what I want to do with it, but how am I gonna use 120 feet of rope? And then when I, looked at the process of making a noose, I saw that there, it, again, and in the, in the practicality and in the practical details, I saw that there are a couple of ways, depending on the weight of the individual that would be hung, that you tie the neck of the noose. So the anatomy of it is fairly simple, but it's the loop that goes around, and then there's the neck that actually holds the support for the body. And there was an urban legend because typically you would only do around six to eight loops, roughly. Um, but there was an urban legend that uh, 13 were done. And I found that interesting because obviously, you know, the figure 13 and all the strange, uh, you know, spookiness around that. But I thought, what would it be like if 
that number was endless. What would it look like if instead of there being a loop at all, it just was the constant coil and there was actually no loop that anything could be put through. So when I started to do that and I tested it on rope that was smaller and had less thickness than the manila rope, the actual rope itself started to coil and envelop on itself. And it started to like go very inward in a way where it was like almost combating me as I was trying to tie it. Um, and so when I started to make the work, it truly felt like I was battling a python. It very much felt like there was something very active trying to fight against this nature of this constant motion. And so as such, I started to think about the elements that kind of pieced together my thought process in the, in the work. And when I thought about the Americas and the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, um, I thought about the term Americana, which by its definition is materials concerning or characteristics of America, its civilization and its culture. And then again, as I was literally wrestling with this <laughs> giant rope, which is relatively heavy, um, I thought about a, a python. And the Ouroboros is an ancient symbol of a snake that is eating its own tail. And for me, I felt like that was the perfect connective tissue between the history and how cyclical the nature and the hatred and the inherent racism in its history is, but also how it's usually veiled and shielded in the aspect of Americana. When you Google Americana, you get like apple pie and baseball and <laughs> malls that are in the Midwest, and you don't get all of the underbelly of what America can be. And we've done a lot of work and a lot of progress so that it's not that anymore, but we still have a long way to go. And so I wanted to make sure that both in the titling and in the work, it felt as though there was this combative nature, both from like a past and present his, like historiography, but also just the actual work itself felt like it was combating me as I was making mm -hmm. it. Right, and you can see that in the, your video as Definitely. well. <laughs> but then the shape of the work the circle hmm. also connotes, you know, something infinite. Right, yes. So the idea so that these- also have something complete. Hmm. I think you might have both perspectives that you can look at. That's true. Yeah. So I think now we'll move on to another installation view and we would like to bring in Salvador Munez. Awesome. So let me share the screen again. So just one more look at your installation or part of your installation. And then in the adjacent space, so this is the sunroom, adjacent space, the sun porch, is an installation by Salvador Munez and the exhibition is called A Sincere Gesture. Um, it is a large scale sculpture and I don't want to talk too much about it. I'll let um, Salvador talk about it. I just wanted to show everyone what it looks like. Hey, Sal. Hello Salvador. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, Kamari, congratulations. Um, your uh, installation is uh, fantastic and it was such a treat to be able to hear you um, um, speak about it. Thank you, yeah. It was a lot of fun installing with you. Hectic yeah. day, but a really fun one. <laughs> hey, we made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we did. Congratulations to you both. And I just wanted to touch upon a question that you had brought up earlier, Kamari, and then um, Salvador, maybe during that question or during the answer, if you could also talk about um, your installation briefly. So there's this, Kamari, as you noticed, this absence of the figure. Mm -hmm. like, um, and then for Salvador, it's the presence of this large scale figure. Mm -hmm. And, but yet yeah, both of your installations are minimal in terms of maybe number of objects 
but Salvador, yours is very vibrant in color. Um, so there are very there are a lot of uh, connections between both your installations mm -hmm. and also stark differences. Um, and it's just it's great to see the dialogue between your works because you're also talking about you know forgotten or buried histories or mm -hmm. cultural histories um, throughout the time. So how is it with you know, Salvador's vibrant figure-based installation and Kamar, your absence of the figure. Mm. Can you both talk about that relationship? Totally, yeah. Sal, if you want to start. Yeah, so I, I guess I can just give like a brief overview of sort of like the, the concept of my project and then sort of dive into the, um, the figure portion. So um, as Eileen mentioned, it is a large scale uh, recreation of Xochipilli, who is the Mexica deity of flowers. Uh, Mexica is a pre-colonial um, indigenous group in Mexico. Um, and Xochipilli is a deity who's strongly associated with flowers, but is also representative of art and music and beauty and sexuality, um, and is strongly associated uh, with queer interpretations of se sexuality and gender. Um, Xochipilli is a, a dual deity, so has uh, both a masculine and a feminine embodiment. Mm -hmm. uh, but even in his masculine embodiment, he's still very strongly associated with uh, the feminine. Um, and so for, for me, for this project, it was really about unearthing um, this uh, pre these pre-colonial conceptions of gender and sexuality um, and the their place within pre-colonial society that has sort of been uh, really like uh, intentionally obfuscated, right? Intentionally hidden uh, and transformed uh, through colonization, right? To sort of serve um, like uh, the gender binary that, that col colonialism relies on to with uphold its power structures. Um, so I think that uh, for me, having the figure uh, representative was really important um, because it was about um, unearthing these hidden histories um, that have sort of been denied um, and um, intentionally um, distorted. Yeah, wow, that makes a lot of sense. I, I find it very interesting that even though there is, for both of us, the attempt to make something opaque, non-opaque, there's such a gradient in how we've done that. Like yours is one large maximalist <laughs> and vibrant sculpture. And mine is a bunch of mini pieces uh, that are very minimalist and not as grand in scale, but still there's the same conversation that's happening. Um, yeah, wow, that's really cool. I also find it interesting that um, the deity has the a male and female figure, and in the story that I was initially inspired by, there is a male and female aspect. Um, so yeah, that's that's really cool to kind of have that shared uh, connection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I was really uh, blown away when I um, when we were installing together because. Um, like in, in reading like our descriptions, right? I do think that there's sort of like a natural sort of like play, but then when you see it installed, it takes a minute to sort of um, like uh, uh, congeal like these narratives. But when, when you, once you do, it's, it makes like so much sense. Um, yeah, definitely, absolutely. Yeah, and then, yeah, it's like, it's kind of really cool to have your giant figure there because mine and my space is so uh, figureless that I feel like it kind of ties everything together. Like you have a bunch of objects in one space and then you have one giant figure in another. And it, seem, it seems as though just that conversation needed to happen with the way that the works are kind of manifested. So I'm also really appreciative of that because I have no figures in my space. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that there's like an interesting, and we've talked about this before, but there's an interesting play on like our use or 
our use of color, right? Like my color palette is very vibrant, very Definitely. maximalist. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And I really, I was trying to, because I was trying to reinforce the queerness of, of the, the deity and the subject matter that I'm working with, like yeah. through the materiality of the objects, I went as far like left with it as I could go. Sure. Um, whereas you have like a very muted, very like uh, minimalist, very understated like color palette. Um, yeah. 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 Definitely, yeah. It's, all, it's like, it's intentionally earthy almost. It's very, very muted in that way, which is funny because your sculpture is made of flowers, which <laughs> then, and once again, relates to the earth. So there's definitely a lot of connective tissue that is present, um, not so intentionally, but uh, necessarily so, <laughs> I would say, which is really cool. Definitely, yeah. And then I also think that there's an interesting, like, uh, like an approach to addressing like colonial forms of violence, right? Because oh. as much as as vibrant as my work is, mm -hmm. like, um, and I'm like insistent on it being like a celebration of like queerness that exists on this um, axis of like uh, pre-colonialism. Uh, oh. Uh, Mexica identity, uh, Mexican, Chicano identity. Um, mm. uh, that, but there is like within that history, right? It was a very violent process to sort of erase these these things from us. Um, uh, and and there's like um, <clears throat> a sense of like defiance that I was kind of trying to, and resilience that I was kind kind of trying to convey, which I also feel like comes through in your work as well. Um, yeah. And in addition to there being a celebratory aspect, I would say that there's a much more commemoratory aspect and that so much of the work is to either investigate or commemorate something. So it's interesting to have both of those. But yes, the the uh, critique on violence and erasure is definitely both uh, present in your, your show and mine. Absolutely. Certainly is, and I look forward to continuing discussion during uh, Salvador's talk yes. on Friday, August 6th at 1230 on Zoom. So I hope you all can join us then and have a chance to see both of their shows at Wave Hill. But right now, I would like to open it up to the audience to see if you have any more questions. Yeah. We do have the question from Jesse. Oh, I th think that oh, I you think do. that regarding the uh, rope work. That's true. Yes, yes. But happy to answer any other questions that others may have. Okay, so Gwen says, I'm curious to know how the architecture of sunroom space and porch informs the decisions in sculptural forms. Uh, one of the images I saw cast a shadow and the arched window in the gallery overlapped with the chalkboard and the game. Nuance critique of history of this effect. Um, yeah, the architecture and the space informed my decision completely because I wanted to ensure that everything felt as though it was cohesive and then nothing felt like it was combating each other. Additionally, I wanted to make sure that if something were to be seen and needed to be seen, that it would be seen easily. So like where the screen is, is intentional to those side facing windows so that when the natural sunlight comes in, it's not obscuring the video. Um, where the gallows is, is intentional to that room because it is kind of the largest sculpture in the space. And it made sense to use the negative space in the room in that way so that your eyes are immediately drawn to that corner. And then you can kind of rotate and view the entire space as a whole as you come down the ramp into the room. So I was very informed by the space, both based on the decisions that I could make but also the, the decisions that seemed the most practical to make in the space. Great, I think we have time for one more question. 
Kyun says, thank you. Interesting to think about this place that used to be a private estate in the context of your work. Yeah, uh, it was actually interesting when I was present with my friend who again is an architect doc, he'd noted that the sunroom and the sun porch in their entirety were actually built as an afterthought based on the structure of the rooms and the spaces. So they weren't like an initial um, part of the building, but were only uh, built and erected later on. And you kind of noticed that when you step into the room based on like the sizing of the windows and how there's like railing that's immediately outside of the windows and the sun porch and stuff like that. Some kind of interesting mm -hmm. obscure uh, markers that kind of speak to the fact that it's still a uh, private. Mm -hmm. And then the sun porch was subsequently enclosed. Right. 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 So, another aspect. Um, I see a question from Sheen. Uh, thank you. It says, thank you. Uh, being that these violent nature of these histories you are confronting, um, are these subjects triggers for you? How has the process of making the work and the exhibition changed you? Um, that's a great question. I would say that Hmm. It's an interesting way to answer that. Let's see. I would say that when you live a certain kind of life as a, as a person of color in America, there's a lot that you're desensitized to. Um, not in a positive way and not because you should be, but almost sometimes to me, because it feels like you have to be as a mode of survival. So I would say that as opposed to being triggered by some of the subject matter, I am more intrigued as to how I can use my knowledge and share enough of what I have to prevent it from happening again, or to use what I know as a moment to hopefully educate somebody that may be uninformed or misinformed about something that has happened ad nauseum in the past. Um, it's never fun, but I do think that it's necessary work. Um, I would say that the work and the exhibition has changed me in the way of understanding, as I mentioned earlier, the practicality of the harm in the history and how I could kind of see uh, how it made sense to do what was done at that time. I, because I had never built anything like that, it wasn't something I thought about. And now that I have, I think about it quite a bit. Um, it's just a, it just ties a lot of things together in the history. Um, but yeah, that's how I would answer that question. But great question. <laughs> great. Thank you, Jean, for that question. Thank you so much, Kamari, Salvador, Jesse, and Gabriel, and everyone for tuning in and hope to see you on August 6th. And yeah. Ellie, if you can stay on, um, we'd like to discuss your prize. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.